Well, I'll get started. Thanks for coming to uh, the Open JDK Bob. I'm Tom Marble. I'm the Open JDK ambassador. Yeah. And uh, so, what I want to uh, really do today is give you sort of an introduction to um, what's going on with uh, Open JDK as an upstream provider of uh, source code to Debian. Uh, then talk about what is kind of the big issues on the free Java packaging roadmap, and then talk about uh, some issues with uh, Java policy, both uh, now and going forward. So uh, I'm really excited to see you all here. I'm hoping that as a result of this, that uh, the main thing is that Java can get to be uh, a, an essential tool, possibly even um, part of the tool chain within, within Debian. Now that it's free software, it can get into main. I think it's really exciting for, uh, for Java developers that uh, have done a lot of work to package Java applications. And based on the work that uh, people like Doko have already done on uh, integration, I think that uh, Java can uh, work really well with, uh, with the Debian system. So with that, just a brief recap of uh, timeline for the OpenJDK project. I'm sure many of you already know this. But um, back on November 13th, we announced the license choice for open source Java, which was the GPL. We used the uh, class path exception exactly like the GNU class path project, which means that if you're a library or application developer, you have complete freedom to choose whatever license you want to have for your library or application, which we thought was really important to give developers the most freedom. So what is OpenJDK? OpenJDK is JDK 7, which is the next release of Java. Today, we're shipping uh, JDK 6 on java.sun.com, and it's also shipped within, uh, with, within Debian uh, in the non-free archive. Um, on November 13th, we, we released the code for just the Hotspot Virtual Machine and the Java compiler, and uh, released that on java.net. So, that was the first time we announced our license choice. Then recently, last month, we uh, announced the, the full release of the source code that we have for OpenJDK. We did this on May 8th at Java 1 in San Francisco, um, which was just uh, a few weeks ago. And with this, what we released was all of the source code for OpenJDK um, and the, that we, that we could release under the GPL. It turns out that 4% of the source code uh, we do not hold copyright for, and because of that, we could only release that functionality as binary plugs. We did that so that you could at least have a fully buildable OpenJDK that would function. Um, and uh, our goal is not that we would live with these, this, this binary, these binary plugs, but it's just a temporary measure until we can replace them with open source uh, equivalents. Because it's very important, we know, for us and for you to have 100% open source implementations for Java. So uh, what we have today is we have source tarballs and uh, read-only subversion repository on the openjdk.java.net site. And we're, as, as time goes along, we hope to build up that infrastructure. It's a little bit limited right now. We have basically some web pages. We have the mailing lists. We have uh, the source code. And we're hoping to build up all other sorts of things. With, for example, um, we want to have more dynamic content. We want to have a host of wiki. We want to bring back our OpenGrok source code browser that we were using for Hotspot and Java C after November 13th. Um, we've decided on Mercurial as our distributed version control system, and we'll have Mercurial uh, repositories uh, available on that website, both for the mainline trunk and also for experimental projects. And um, we, all, we have a number of tools, both for building and for QA, internal to Sun, which right now have a lot of internal Sun network dependencies that we're hoping to get rid of and externalize. One of the, perhaps the most important uh, thing you'll see first is whenever we commit code, there's a code review process that goes through uh, where multiple eyes can review uh, a pass that's going in. We have this thing called a web rev, which basically is a series of web pages that shows you for each source code file that's changing 
the, the diffs for that file so that it's easy to see in one change set all of the, all of the changes that are included. Um, and we're working on a solution to, even though right now those are published internally, we're working on a way of making all that information visible on the outside, um, even if it means tarring up some HTML and, and, and posting it on the outside. But we'll, we'll get more of those tools on the outside uh, as soon as we can. One of the things that you'll notice is that's not in the source code right now, uh, it turns out it's not part of the Java SE platform definition, is the plugin code and Java web start code. Together we call that deployment code. I know that this is very important to you, especially for those of you that run on AMD64. Um, I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that uh, the lack of a 64-bit plugin is something that you want. Um, this is RFE number three for all of Java. So. I know that this is something that, that everyone wants, and I'm pushing really hard on, on getting that, that code released as well. Many people, we've already talked this week a little bit about supporting new operating system and chip architecture uh, ports. You know, in the context of Debian, this really means uh, Linux PowerPC, Linux Spark, Linux ARM. And so I think that uh, you'll see, you'll see new, new activity here. We do have some additional source code that we can release that I think will help in doing these ports, and I hope to get that released as soon as possible as well. On, on uh, sort of more of the medium-term roadmap, one of the things that, that we're going to release is some, te some testing uh, code. That's the, uh, the uh, testing compatibility kit, the TCK. The TCK is especially important because the TCK is the way by which a runtime can be certified for actually complying with the, the Java specification. So for example, um, Sun is very keen on Debian shipping 100% uh, shipping free Java, and we really would love it if, if we can um, have it pass the TCK so that it can get branded as Java compatible. As you know, branding is sometimes a tricky thing, and you know I'm exquisitely aware of a lot of the branding challenges that uh, have gone in the past with other, other upstream software. But this is something that we really want to do. We know that the TCK has to be available um, uh, free, as in beer, at least. And um, I don't think that we'll be able to release the TCK as free as in free speech, at least not initially, but at least free as in free beer. And figuring out how to get that done with Debian is one of my priorities. I just want to say a word about um, upstream source code. It's Java is an extraordinarily complex project comprising something like 6.5 million lines of code. And because there are hundreds of engineers that work on it, there isn't one trunk. There are these several major different code repositories that all have various integration points throughout a build cycle. And because of this complexity of, of the way the source code is organized, um, or the development flow is organized, we really had to have a distributed source code control system. And as a result, uh, for a variety of reasons, I don't want to go into right now, but I can later if you want. Uh, we've chosen Mercurial as the system that we'll use. And uh, as I mentioned, we don't have Mercurial available on the OpenJDK site now, but we hope to do that very soon. One of the areas that, that is a, a really huge technical challenge for us is uh, bug flow and bug tracking. Um, currently, we have an internal system that, that can't be open source and has all kinds of str strange hooks into it to various internal systems. I mean, you're familiar with, the, actually the, the Debian VTS is quite sophisticated and has a lot of interesting, interesting hooks in it. Um, you can imagine that for, for the Sun VTS that's been built up over time, we have a lot of interesting hooks too, and it's hard to kind of unwind from that. We're hoping to have some sort of gateway between a publicly accessible external bug tracker and any of those hooks so that more and more uh, handling upstream bugs with OpenJDK can be easier. Right now we have an external web page that um, there's sort of a two-step process to have an incident that you sub submit on that page turning into an actual Sun bug number. Um, if anyone has some suggestions about you know, either specific software or approaches to handling that, especially with upstream, downstream integration for bug tracking, that would be great. Um, so now let's talk about the roadmap and kind of the big picture of what, what has to happen or what's going to happen with Java. First of all, um, 
to get started right now, there's a real desire to, to build from 100% open source without binary plugs, and that's the ICT project that you've probably heard about. I'll say some more words about that in the next slide. Um, but the goal is ultimately to replace um, those binary plugs or, or apps with open source completely functional equivalents. And so just to give you an example, what we're talking about here, it's a graphics rasterizer, font rasterizer, color chooser, parts of the crypto code, and some of the audio engine. Um, the prize for completing this, when we get it done, is that then OpenJDK can actually get into main and then be used as a build dependence for other libraries and applications, which we know is really important. And as a result, you know, what we're hoping is that this will revitalize developer interest in developing and packaging, distributing both libraries and applications. So now just a couple of words about Ice-T. Um, so Ice-T is basically OpenJDK without the binary plugs. On uh, ice-t.classpath.org today, what you'll find is there's a wiki that's set up, there's a Mercurial repository and Bugzilla set up. The Mercurial repository is not, just so you know, is not a duplication of the OpenJDK tree. It's basically all of the, the build code, the auto confiscation that's required to wrap around uh, OpenJDK. There are some deltas to OpenJDK which are in this, but just so you know that this Mercurial repository represents basically the the build fixes to go around what comes out of uh, stock OpenJDK tarballs. Right now, today, uh, the uh, ICT repository is based on our most recent build of OpenJDK, which is build 13. Um, and we're hosting the mailing list for this project on the OpenJDK site, because one of the things that we actually have that works is mailing lists. Um, the mailing list is uh, distro package dev. Um, you can get to that either on openjdk.java.net and up in the upper left hand corner there's a link for mailing lists. For those of you that prefer to use main, it's also a gateway to main, so you can use that as an easy way of uh, getting access to it. A little bit more about Ice-T, it can be bootstrapped with uh, GCJ, it has to be a newer version of GCJ though, however, in fact, you need to use the version of GCJ that's in unstable to build Ice-T. Um, once IST has been built, then it can be used to bootstrap itself. Eventually, this will, you know, OpenJDK or IST will get into the archive almost certainly with a circular build depends. Um, and IST is really that really provides a framework for doing the open source replacements. You know, we realize that most of the, the developers that work in the free software world are not going to experiment with software that includes binary blobs. So that's why IST is a great way to, to work on closing these encumbrances without having to hit, touch any binary blocks at all. And the goal is that, that uh, as the OpenJDK infrastructure gets built out and as we've had a chance to evaluate the alternatives from ClassPath and other places, that this code will get back, merged back into the mainline uh, OpenJDK. Um, Part of what we ask contributors to do with OpenJDK is sign the Sun Contributor Agreement. It's a non-exclusive copyright assignment, which means you keep all of your rights to copyright. You just give Sun the right to handle uh, copyright, for example, if license version changes should come up. And I'm sure, you know, I, I mentioned this on Sunday for those of you that were in the talk on Sunday. Um, I've been talking a lot with Mark Dillard of the ClassPath project and a number of the developers about how to uh, work with the FSF and the Software Freedom Law Center to ensure that we can do this legally and get the um, uh, grant backs where, where appropriate for class path code such that it can be included and merged into OpenJDK. Um, so this will, this will, we're handling this on a case-by-case -case basis right at the moment. And I, to give credit where credit is due, uh, the IC project was done by Andrew Haley. Um, in at Fedora, and uh, Andrew was here on Sunday, for those of you that, that were at the talk on Sunday, um, and his team uh, were the ones that were behind Ice-T. So now, what, is, what about Ice-T and Debian? So, uh, Mendy has uh, already been working on some initial packages. He's got some uh, initial packages 
for uh, a meta package for all the build dependencies you need to build Ice T, and uh, also Ice T itself. I didn't put the um, uh, the archive URL up here because he's got a new version of these things that he hasn't published yet. So as soon as he does, I'm sure he'll send an email to Debian Java or to Distro Package Dev, possibly both. So stay tuned, stay tuned for that. Um, so that you can get Ice-T and, and build it on Debian. Um, right now, we're waiting. There, there were a couple of source, source files within Build 13 that didn't have complete headers, and Fedora has decided they want to wait until those are fixed before they actually upload Ice-T into the Fedora repository. And I think it's probably a good idea to do the same with, uh, with Debian. So Build 14 is scheduled for the end of June, which probably means the end of next week. Uh, is when Build 14 will come out. And so, assuming those things get fixed, then ICT would be a candidate to be uploaded to Experimental. Um, and one of the things I talked briefly with Steve Lang Langstack about was making uh, OpenJDK a release goal for Lenny. And in the Lenny time frame, I see no reason why we can't have OpenJDK be a completely free Java uh, solution for Lenny that can go into main. A um, couple of things to keep in mind, um, OpenJDK is JDK 7 Alpha, so, um, you know, the really awesome news about OpenJDK is that it's free software, the somewhat challenging news is that it's still under development. This is not, you know, uh, by any means finalized. There's a lot of major changes that are going into the platform, including support for Java, the Java module system, so there may be you know, there may be some breakage that happens along the way, just so, so you know. And I, I think that that's one of the reasons why there is some value for, for people that, that, that uh, use non-free to use, keep the uh, production Java 6 uh, JDK and non-free. When are you planning to um, analyze Java 7? To release Java 7? We don't really have a firm schedule for releasing Java 7. Um, uh, however, it's probably 2008 sometime. So it's a couple years away. Um, one of the things that we will do once we have the TCK available is we'll, we'll have a build option for building uh, OpenJDK to match the uh, JDK 6 platform definition. Now I know this is sort of legal subtlety, but um, kind of what's important to, to, to think about in this is that this way we can have OpenJDK 7, which is really the experimental, unstable, leading edge version, and this, with, with the build option for JDK 6, we can get a, a much more stable, yet free software version of Java into main. So that's just sort of a high level description. Yeah. So will, will, so will the JDK, if, if, if it's built with JDK 6, will the resulting be, you know, a, Will the resulting pro product be official Java, you know, Java compatible or whatever? Uh, and also, will that be suitable for? Uh, I mean, I understand there's no warranty on on uh, on Gratis or uh, Java products, but will will that be as suitable for uh, production use? That's the idea. Um, as I mentioned before, we were working on the specific details of how to get the TCK available to you so that we can confirm that it is, in fact, Java compatible and how to make sure the Debian project can use Java compatible branding so that you, we know that A, technically it meets the Java platform specification, B, that, that it has the branding that, that you and Debian users can recognize, and then at that point, C, I feel pretty comfortable calling it production quality. Cutter. Well, this again is claimed to be slightly um, incomplete in the local user interface testing area. No, it's it's absolutely complete. In fact, it, it, the TCK insists on pixel for pixel correctness. Okay. So, do, if it passes TCK, there is no question that it's going to be the same experience as the. Um, if it passes the TCK, it's going to be. The same experience. Of course, legally, if I was a lawyer, I would say that passing the TCK is um, a necessary 
but not complete guarantee that it actually matches the entirety of the Java platform specification. But between us kids, if it passes the TCP, you're done. So, um, so after all this work, what do we get? What's the payoff? And I just have one slide on this because I, I know, you know, I actually, you know, kind of what I'm really hoping to get from you is uh, your ideas as to what we can do. And uh, I'm really trying to, to encourage uh, support from you guys to be packagers for all these things. Um, there's a lot of different things that we can package for Debian. Right now, NetBeans is not in Debian for two reasons. One is that um, it's under the cuddle today and there's been some controversy about Cuddle with the Debian project. You know, um, I'm talking to a number of people, uh, the Debian legal people about that, and you know, we're making some progress. I think there's some interest in possibly considering Cuddle, assuming we can address the choice of venue concern. The other problem, which is a more technical problem with NetBeans, is like a lot of Java applications, NetBeans packages a lot of dependent library jars all on its big installer tarball. And of course, this is not the Debian way, you know. Um, which is really frustrating. The good news is I've got the director of NetBeans on board with uh, <coughs> Linux and free software. He fully understands that NetBeans 6 has to be refactored into open source components and he's told his team that this is part of the release milestone for uh, NetBeans 6. So I'm hoping that NetBeans 6 as refactored, whether it's under Cuddle or we get it licensed under another license, will be suitable for Linux. Um, as far as libraries go, um, I'm working on packaging the Java help library now. One that you may have heard of that was released a couple weeks ago by Choltec is uh, Jambi, which is the Qt bindings for, uh, for uh, Java bindings for Qt um, under the GPL. I think that, that will be interesting. I've also talked with um, a number of people like Andrew Cowie who are working on Java bindings for GNOME or improved Java bindings for GNOME. Um, that's another thing that I think would be helpful. There's all kinds of really great server uh, application servers or server-related infrastructure things that would be, I think, very useful for Debian. One is the Glassfish application server, which is the reference implementation for Java EE. Um, Grizzly, which is just, just the, the fast web container part of Glassfish that's been broken out into its own project. Uh, you may have heard of Grizzly. Um, it's, uh, in some sense, it's a functional competitor to Tomcat. Um, it has the advantage that it has some of the, the smartest people at Sun working on that using um, the new I.O. library and concurrency libraries. And this is actually our poster child for how or why Java applications with dynamic compilation can outperform static compilation in C. Um, the performance is really good with Grizzly, so I think that people will be excited to play with that. Um, uh, I've mentioned to some of you Wonderland. This is sort of the follow-on to Looking Glass 3D. Right now, Wonderland is, is uh, published under a non-free license, but relicensing is, is in progress. Wonderland is basically open source second life. It's a uh, 3D world simulation. There's both a server component to it and a GUI front-end client component to it. The main difference with second life is that in second life, all of your models are locked in the world. Um, with, uh, with Wonderland, you'll have full control not only of the software, but also the, the things that you put into the world. So um, obviously this will require uh, advanced OpenGL support, but I think that people will be really excited to see, to see that. In terms of client tools, I just want to mention Jmaki and Orbit. You know, in the past you, you know, may have seen that Sun has been pretty religious about languages, that you, the only language you're ever supposed to use is Java. But you know, now there's some recognition that people might use other languages like JavaScript and that Ajax may actually be a popular um, framework for doing GUI development. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the team has done is this thing called Orbit, which is a, uh, basically looking at the way people are doing Ajax and uh, cutting in half the number of round trips that have to be done um, using some, some tricks in the HTTP protocol. This is in Java. I think that when this gets packaged for Debian, people will be really excited to play with it. Um, and then, of course, there's all kinds of applications. You probably know about more of these applications than, than I do, but uh, I've seen an ITP for OpenStreetMap. Um, uh, Raphael was showing us the other night uh, Power Rock, which is getting things done in Java. Spring. Um, sorry? Spring. One very popular yeah. new framework. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Very popular. Um, you may have heard of uh, Danny Hill's new project, MetaWeb or Freebase, which is basically, think of it as like 
an open wiki like open encyclopedia knowledge base that they're working on. Um, there will be a Java front end to that. Um, so if you have ideas for Java applications that should be packaged, I, I even just love <coughs> the name of the package. Get extra credit if you know the upstream URL, and if you're willing to help package it, that'd be, that'd be really awesome. So now, in order to make stuff work, in order to make Java applications just work in Debian, we need to, I think, take a good look at Java policy. We need to tweak some things with Java policy, um, mainly because it's, it's sort of complicated. And I think that the payoff, though, in, in revisiting Java policy is that we'll end up with a really great experience for, um, for Java developers and Debian users. I mean, my, my personal success criteria for, for revising Java policy is that not only can we agree on how to do Java for Debian, but also for other free software distros like Fedora, and that uh, Debian would become a premier place to do Java development, which then could be used in other, even not free operating systems. So here's just sort of a, a grab bag of things that we need to handle or cover. So a lot of these things are already covered today in Java policy, but just want to review them. One is handling uh, the different runtime alternatives and the priority system. Um, one of the issues about the alternatives is not every implementation has every binary. So for example, the Sun implementations, the Sun runtimes have things like PAC 200 that a number of the other ones don't. Um, so we have to decide how we handle that if we have some sort of dummy alternative or some other solution. Um, we need to figure out how to make man pages agree with the runtimes that are selected. Currently we do that um, by an elaborate system of slaving uh, alternatives, uh, sitting on man pages with the alternative system. Um, I did look recently at uh, how Gentoo does their thing, which is very clever. Um, and I'm going to publish something on Debian Java about, about how Gentoo does this. Um, basically, the short answer is what they do is they insert in like the Etsy <coughs> profile that the um, a path that they prepend to every user's man path uh, that has a symbolic link in it so that basically whenever the user or the system changes the default version of Java, that symbolic link has changed and because of that their man path is up to date and when, when they say man Java C, for example, they just get the right man page. So I don't know if that could work with Java, you know, Debian Java policy, but that's, or Debian policy generally, but Anyway, man pages have to be there and have to agree. Just as a note to be aware of, De uh, Debian policy requires that all software in Debian work without setting environment variables. So, so setting, setting, setting man path would be cheating. Setting man path would be, at least in my opinion, cheating. Yeah. Um, however, there may be an option to add something to the man path in the man program. Uh, going a little more upstream. Okay. I mean, if we're going to change the man path for everyone on Debian, the functional equivalent thereof is to put a new is put something new in the default path of man. Okay. Or allow, or allow there to be a .d directory for man path. Yeah. Which there might be, I don't even know. Yeah, which would make, which might possibly make some sense in this sort of a context. I mean, we avoided that in the past um, because of the idea that we should really follow the FHS and install all the damn pages in one place. And most of the reason why people do that is because they had software all over the place. But this is a this is a much better reason for eventually having directories in the man path where you have more, I assume the problem is you have a bunch of you have a large set of, of development uh, man pages with not section one but section something else. Yeah, right. That you need to swap depending on which JVM right. is enabled. Exactly. And that's a, that's a hard problem that right now is mostly solved with conflicts, which is not really the direction you want to go because it prevents you from installing more than one JVM at the same time. I had never thought of changing man like that, but that seems like a, a really interesting compromise. So thanks. Um, that's so obviously that's that's one. One thing that has to be done. The other thing is, you know, we need a way to select which runtime you're going to use. Today we have the script that Doko wrote, which is uh, update Java alternatives, um, which works pretty well. Although I'm a little concerned that for end users, that you know, using the command line might be a little scary. Um, so, you know, I think it might be handy to have a GUI equivalent to this tool, so that you know, users that are not used to the command line can, you know, choose which alternative they want to use. Um, one of the other things that, that, that was sort of interesting about Gentoo is they allow this idea of having a system-wide default like we do, but they also have this idea of having a user default, which could be different. Um, and the tricky part again is man pages, but if we can figure, figure out a, 
technical solution to, to how to do that, that might be interesting. So that you know each user in the system could could pick their own. Um, so here's some sort of miscellaneous things um, about integration. There's just other ways that Java can be better integrated with the Debian system. You know, obviously there's there's desktop related files that can can be used. I don't know, you know, if people think that click, you know, clicking or, or executing jars is interesting. You know, bit format misc is you know, um, is something that we should do or not. Um, some people feel strongly about it, others don't. Um, there is there is a bizarre there's a bizarre standard in the way that jar jars are packaged like an offset 36 or something. It looks like a zip file, and so you have to play some games to make sure you can recognize a jar file as distinct from a zip file. Um, one thing that we don't do right now, and now since I formerly was in the Java performance group, I'm kind of sensitive to, is we don't really have a way of doing command line tuning. Uh, you know, so part of what we've done in the Java performance group is we've realized that customers uh, don't like sifting through 800 command line options, and they do a kind of bad job of it generally. However, if you are putting stuff in production and you get experience with it and you actually understand what you're doing, you very well might want to set things like uh, your initial heap size, your various collector policies, your compilation thresholds, and so especially for production use, command line settings are very important and we don't have a standard way to do that. Um, and to make things even more complicated, the way you do that and the exact arguments are going to be different based, based on which runtime you have. So I don't know what the solution is, but it'd be really nice if we had a solution and policy that, that kind of abstracted that out in a way that was nice. I, I don't know. I mean, I always found the, the command line option to be weird. Why not a config file where you can just specify minus f file? And in the config file, you can specify what you want, and it's not one long string of random characters that nobody understands. But you could have a reasonable meaning options that would actually say heap size, colon, variable, and so on. Yeah, that actually that actually makes some sense because you know what I do typically when I when I run uh, performance benchmarking. So I, I haven't had a separate file, but I usually have like in a shell script, I have like my, my heap settings, I have my compiler settings, I have my, um, you know, other sort of miscellaneous settings, and then I combine yeah. it into one arcs thing, and so there's no reason that we, you could do that sort of thing in a config file. Thinking from a runtime point of view, uh, the problem is you have a very long uh, option, I mean, yes, what you get is you get a lot of options, but you don't even know which jar file you're running. And that's pretty annoying, especially on some areas where you have limits with with to the respect of the, the command, line. command line that is shown by PS. So if that could be changed by Java minus F, whatever your config file is for that particular Java file. And maybe a default per user or system wide you know path in, in as a dot file or an ETC. Yeah. But yeah. the other nice thing about once you have config files then you can stack them. So you can have a system wide config file and you apply the users over top of it and then you apply whatever was given on the command line over top of that. That's actually that's actually a good RFP for upstream. There may be a local config yeah. file, but it has to be configurable both for each instance yeah. separately. Because we have well, yeah. servers where we can well, that, you, yeah. could, you could allow several instances. Yeah, right. yeah, you could allow system wide per user dash f of the specify one or and and just arbitrary command line options too. Yeah, and usually what they do with that kind of thing is that you if, if, if either, either you don't stack either you don't stack them at all, in which case it reads whatever one you want. But the nicer one is if you stack them by default. But you have an option that says don't read any of the default files and only do what I tell you to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 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 very interesting. Um, I'm not going to remember all this, so I hope somebody's taking good notes. Um, or in our video. Uh, so let's see. More Java policy stuff. So I think we can do a lot to help people that are packaging packaging Java. Um, one of the things that has been asked for as upstream watchers. Now, right now, you know, we're releasing OpenJDK not exactly on a regular frequency. It's sort of every two weeks. Um, and right now, for, for at least for a couple, couple more builds, it's going to be tarballs. But as soon as we, as soon as we get over to Mercurial, I, I'm, I'm sure that there'd be a way to, to watch, watch that for a, for a new promoted build. Um, the other thing that we need for packagers is we need a way of ex expressing, you know, dependence on a particular runtime. For example, do you need 
does your application or does your library need to have something that meets Java SE 5 or is it Java SE 6 or Java SE 7? So, you know, one of the ideas that I had is maybe we could define or provide like, you know, Java 5 dash runtime or Java 6 dash runtime. I don't know if that's the right way to do it. That's one way to do it. Uh, one of the ideas that, that Doko had was maybe we should have, um, instead of just user bin Java for everything, we should have something in user bin like user bin Java 5, user bin Java 6. And then those would be, you know, would be uh, slaves as appropriate. Um, You're probably going to want both of those, I think. Okay. Yeah, I think so. The advantage of having both of them is then, then you can make a definition that says uh, Java 6 runtime provides user bin Java 6. So anything that right. uses user bin Java 6 depends on Java 6 runtime. Okay. And then I can write a Lintian check for it. <laughs> Lintian checks, yes. And that's, and that's a great idea, Lintian. I didn't put that in there, but. Got to have that. And then as the alternative would refer, would let the user choose what user bin Java is. Right, but in that way, only the Java runtimes that provide Java 6 will provide an alternative for user bin Java 6, so the user only gets the choice of the ones that actually work. It could also be done like the Python policy uh, with default versions and such. Yeah. Yep. I don't know enough about the, the Python policy is a considerably more complicated, and I don't know exactly how it works. <laughs> Doka, do you know something about Python policy? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that was off topic. Oh, I, I think I think it's sort of complicated Python because Python uh, they have a user lead Python number uh, 2.4, 2.5, 2 6, and uh, below this uh, all the library stuff. I mean, it's for me it's very simple. So that's the thing you may actually want to borrow from. Speaking of Python policy, is that one of the, that's the complexity. That one of the complexities I was thinking of is the whole system for uh, if you have a random Python module, getting it installed with the version of the Python you have installed. You're going to have the same problem with Java libraries. A lot of them are going to work with the various different runtimes, and you're going to want to be able to install one the one library package and have it be enabled for all those runtimes, rather than creating separate Debian packages for each runtime version. And the Python experience may very well be a good thing to copy there. You don't, ha you don't have the problem with, uh, with Java because you don't have something like uh, binary extensions for Java. So. Yeah. Well, but, but, there are, but there are certainly going to be extensions that, there's certainly going to be Java libraries that will not work with anything later than 6 or will not work with anything prior to 7 or... Right, but that kind of thing is solved by having uh, an interpreter used which uh, provides a certain level of Java compatibility. For example, Java 5. So, it, well, you can put all um, Java libraries into USR shared Java, uh, but if you pick up uh, the wrong uh, library with the wrong interpreter, it's your fault. That's a good point. Yeah, I'm making it complicated. Um, simpler is better, but uh, what, what is it? Make it as simple as possible and no simpler? Um. Uh, one thing, I just mentioned this thing about live, multiple library versions. I think that because a lot of upstreams have had this sort of really bad habit of including all their dependent jars, that uh, sometimes sort of a, the initial way out of this, and just to troll you, I'll just mention the word maven, uh, some people may want to have lots and lots of different versions of libraries in the archive. I, I think that we need to find a kind of a, a rational policy for having like different major ABI versions of libraries in the archive and maybe, you know, but only one of those, one of each major ABI version or something like that. So there's a compromise between, you know, uh, having different ABI choices but not having the archive filled with, you know, you know, a hundred different versions of an XML processor. And uh, people on the list, uh, Debian Java list, have suggested Dev Helper and CDBS kinds of support. You know, once we, once we figure out an evolved Java policy, I think that it'll be important to have tools like this for packagers. Um, part of the challenge, too, is that I did some research on the documentation of Java policy on, you know, the, the Debian wiki and uh, other places, and there's, like, lots of different places where, where the policy is written in, in different time zones, going back to 2004, and I think we need to coordinate documentation on that. Ideally, to be included in the Debian policy package. Which is down the road. Authoritative. Yes. Okay, so uh, drive better upstream library and application behavior. So, um, part of the problems we have with Java are not unique to, to uh, Debian or not even unique to Linux for that matter. 
Um, part of it is that, you know, well, you know, for whatever reason, some Java developers run on Windows. I have no idea why, but some of them do. Um, and I think that if, you know, we collaborate with people, other distros like Fedora, on, you know, dependency graphs for popular libraries and applications, um, and also co cooperate on bug flow, um, it, you know, we may save collective community energy on, on dealing with uh, upstream libraries and applications and hopefully drive better behavior um, to the upstream so that they are, you know, more sensitive to, to bugs and refactoring and those sorts of things. And also library dependencies. And uh, going forward, this is not, you know, kind of in the immediate time frame, but just sort of on the horizon, one of the things that's being discussed for Java 7 is the Java module system, uh, also known as JSR 277, JSR 294, and, and friends. And uh, really, this is something that's been missing in the Java platform for a long time. It's kind of like apt get, but within the Java class loader, um, which is really cool for Java to be able to get beyond a static class path and have jars that actually know something about metadata of other jars. Which is really great. Um, there's already you know, some implemented implementations of this with OSGI. The challenge is that we have to be really careful to make sure that whatever happens here doesn't conflict with the uh, with uh, the dpackage uh, system. And so one of the discussions I had with one of the JSR 277 developers at Sun was how we could do that. And what he said is that in JSR 294, which is uh, describes among other things annotations to to uh, class files, there's a, there's a possibility of having kind of a free format annotation. And so my thought was we can design possibly a synthetic comment for, for Java source code that specifies basically kind of what like the Debian library name would be for that. So that, and make, um, so basically when your Java system is installing or using that kind of a library, it can talk with, uh, to make sure that that uh, everything is in sync, both with the Java module system and and the Debian package repository. So that's uh, that's an overview of uh, free Java roadmap, and uh, kind of used up most of the time. But there's some time for questions, so please go ahead. You mentioned the current implementation lacks a few few bugs. Yes. The list you made only includes uh, client modules, sound, uh, what else? Yeah, that's it's mainly client stuff. Crypto. It's the one thing that might yeah, crypto is the uh, crypto is the one thing, and actually, there's a lot of crypto code there. It was just the, the code that's myth missing is something about combining. I mean, there's already message digest. There's one way encryption, but there's the thing about patch packaging it all together that, that is missing. Um, and the good news is, you know. I was able to introduce Casey Marshall, who you might know from the ClassPath, who's the crypto implementer at ClassPath, with some of the crypto people at Sun. And I'm hoping that we can get that stuff closed. But that brings up a really good point, um, and that is, would it make sense or would anyone be interested in um, defining a headless or server-oriented implementation of a runtime that, that didn't have, specifically didn't have, uh, all of the client-related stuff, because there is a, there is a, a, a definition in the, there's a TCK for to define sort of a headless implementation of Java. Um, I'm not really familiar with it, but I'm just wondering if anyone has has any, any thoughts about server a server runtime. Well, headless and server is not necessarily the same thing. Uh, for example, the boot chart uh, is not Java implementation to take a file and convert it to a PNG or a SVG or whatever. And that's a command line tool that would be very useful to have even without X. And at the moment it fails if it displays that set with plus button. That's really annoying. Mm -hmm. Especially when you are doing a non X test or this is the dependency on the on the platform libraries for X convert bitmap conversions and everything. That's a, a major problem. Well well yeah, it's interesting that you guys mentioned that because one of the first well the first experimental project in OpenJDK is this thing called FB Toolkit. So one of the class path developers wants to develop basically a way of rendering uh, 
Java client stuff in a frame buffer without having to use X at all. And so they actually have a lot of code that they haven't checked in, but, but I think that, that will be one of the interesting experiments is how you can run Java with a frame buffer and not, not with full X. There's, um, a, there's actually a free implementation. The problem is that it's GPL, so in the past it was a bit difficult when you started linking that together with, with proprietary code. But now that uh, Java is GPL as well. Yep, it should be great. Um, well, I see that we're out of time. Um, I'll be around until uh, Sunday morning, so feel free to come back to me now or later on. Don't go. Uh, yeah. For further discussion, uh, it would be nice if we could agree on one mailing list and maybe uh, use an existing one, Debian Java at list.debian.org. So if uh, people do want to uh, contribute, discuss uh, uh, the Java policy for Debian, that would be nice if you could join this list. That's a really good recommendation. Okay, thanks a lot. Can you